so thank you everyone um, for having me. I'm really excited. I've been excited about this um, since I was asked to um, to chat with you. Um, this is, uh, I feel like the, I, the world has changed quite a bit since, <laughs> um, since that first ask. Um, and so in a lot of ways, this is an opportunity um, that I'm going to take, and I hope you will suffer me, um, to think through um, some thoughts I've been having about um, the digital in, in this moment, um, some ways to think about what our work, particularly as digital humanists, is in this, in this particular moment. Um, how do we think about what work digital storytelling can do uh, for us as a practice? Um, and and what we want it, um, and what we want it to do. I mean, I think there's no surprise um, that this is a moment of. Um, I think we're all aware it's a moment of pandemic and protest. Um, and so, what is asked of us now today is very different from what is asked of us in March, um, or January, or February, um, and yet also related. You know, we we know that lives of, um, I'm for my part, I'm especially interested in Black life, um, have existed in in um, this kind of precarity. This 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 precipice on the bridge of disease and disaster for um, generations, centuries, even if you're thinking in the long view that um, that I, I, I encourage us to. Um, and so um, we are being asked today to think of, to, I argue, to um, to call our humanism into, into a different kind of work, into a more urgent work than I think we've ever had to face, um, this generation at least has had to face before. Um, and that goes everything from thinking about um, uh, the map of of, the, of those who are sick um, and ill or to be sick, because um, we can also think about how we might invert that map, invert the red and, and see that as those who are just ailing now and the rest as those who are about to be, because this is what the stakes are. Um, think about the ways that um, we are still, um, we and the collective we of humanity are still trying to make art. Um, so this is Jose Arturo Ballester in Tiempos de Pandemia um, 2020, which is um, images that are hosted at Taller Electric Maronage. Um, Jose was to be our speaker, our artist in residence in the spring last year. Um, and that was um, canceled. He's um, based in Puerto Rico. Um, and, but he has graciously agreed to allow us to showcase some of his work um, and has graciously agreed to allow us to showcase um, some of the work he began to create in the midst of um, the pandemic. Um, and so some of this work is, is here at um, Leisure Grand Asia XYZ. Um, and so there's ways that we are continuing to you know, invoke our humanism and, and use digital spaces and, and the kind of matrices that the digital offers us to continue to create these kind of bridges across time and space and across pandemic and across um, protests. Um, and we are also, you know, thinking about the ways that we can um, acknowledge um, what is not being acknowledged, um, our, our dead, our dying, our soon to be dead. Um, this is a Say Her Name digital memorial created by um, Johns Hopkins University electrician Christina Thomas, who's also a program manager of Life Code. Um, and this is um, uh, this is a, a, a the landing page over at Electric Maronage. Um, you can see um, it will pop up briefly. Um, you can click to go into the actual memorial, um, which walks you through not just um, Brianna Taylor or Corinne Gaines, who you see pictured here, who are both shot by police, but also um, the many, many, many um, Black women um, uh, who have been killed um, by police um, by police violence. And so this was also created in this moment of um, pandemia um, by Christina Thomas. Um, so one of the things I wanna think about are what are the ways, kinds of links that um, we can sew um, in these times, and, and we can think of sewing um, and sewing in, in a whole range of ways. We can think of it as um, it's quilting is the kind of work that um, Black women um, and Black folks have been doing to um, quilt and to stitch uh, together um, ourselves in some ways, literally, and this is Stephen Towns, into the, um, the fragments of um, American ideals and liberty and, and action and inaction. And the stitching that we have done to render that apart um, this is Stephen Towns' Rumination and Reckoning is a quilted study of um, the Nat Turner Revolt. And so here we have the ways that the stitching also um, is about uh, both bringing together the flame that will tear down um, the slaveholding regime and um, also uh, is about uh, not maybe 
entering into American um, bargains and bargaining and what it means to, to invoke something, uh, another kind of resistance practice and strategy. Um, so there's that kind of sewing and then there's this other kind of sewing, a sewing that has been, you know, in some ways more um, familiar and um, imposed on Black life over time and space, the, the work of um, planting, the work of cotton cultivation um, and harvesting sugar, um, which is also the work of technology and the work of um, like today we are here in the digital, but these are some of the um, earliest technological interventions were based and rooted, placed over the bodies of um, Black people and required the bodies of Black people. And even in this, it's interesting to note, so this is um, a 1762 um, rendering of a, of a sugar mill um, um, and of, of the grinding of sugar and the grinding sugar practices. Um, so this is obviously a moment in which uh, we see Black bodies in the images, but you don't see our Black women, um, which is interesting because actually Black women were often um, the figures, would, would have been the figures in these images. They would have been the ones who are feeding sugar cane into the rollers. When you look at the, archive for um, slavery in the Caribbean, in particular, where most of um, the sugar plantations are in Caribbean and, and, and Brazil on the side of the Atlantic, um, you would see that um, uh, Black women often ha are the ones without um, hands, without arms, limbs, because it is very, very easy, particularly in the frenzy of harvest time, and you're rushing to feed, um, it, feed uh, cane into the rollers and to um, maybe for your dress, maybe by your own hand, be pulled into the roller itself. And so one of the sayings in the Caribbean is um, sugar is made with blood. Um, in this case, quite literally, um, sugar is actually made um, with the blood and often it's the blood of black women. Um, so there's a lot of ways to think about like sewing, sewing, um, S-E-W, yes, E-W and S-O-W and the relations between these, um, which is to say I've been thinking a lot about um, filaments and fibers. Um, I've been thinking about what are the what are the links, what are the threads, um, the actual threads that we can weave um, between um, past and present, between um, the what seem like such disparate realities, this sugarcane mill and, and our digital space, like this Zoom experience and their digital spaces. Um, uh, and in, the, in her Nobel Prize lecture, and I'm sure this will be very familiar to many of you, um, but for those who it is not, delivered in 1993, um, uh, Toni Morrison, ancestor Toni Morrison, who had then, by then written six novels, including Song of Solomon, Jazz, and Beloved, um, spoke a modern day fable of an older blind woman, a bird, and a group of young people with a question. And I will leave it to you to, to go deep into the, this Nobel lecture, which is, I mean, everything Morrison does is a work of art, um, but this is a particular work of art. Um, and as a sister Toni Morrison, a quote um, from that, um, an oft-repeated quote is, we die, that may be the meaning of life, but we do language, that may be the measure of our lives. Uh, and here Morrison is speaking of language and its power, obviously, it's Nobel Prize in literature, um, but I, kind of came back to this thinking about how she's speaking of measures which you can think of or think with as in um, musical context, as in literally the marking of time in a musical, um, in, in musical composition, um, as well as in speaking with and through um, the, how time in, and language speaks with and through this blind older woman speaking to um, young people, um, how she is also making a case about time and intergenerational work and accessibility and the superpowers embedded in disability, um, the superpower to see the underside of time's crossings, um, to see the connections between things, time as a marker of our humanity and language as a measure of what we do with that, with that time. Um, and so I'm coming back to this uh, as a way to kind of think about you know, some of the strangeness that is digital time. I think one of, the, one of the phrases I hear often in thinking about this corona moment is that time is a circle. <laughs> and it does feel that way. Time is both elongated in these strange ways and it's also truncated um, in these um, really kind of compact measures. Um, and yet there's a kind of tensile strength to the filaments and fibers that are connecting us across time and space. Um, and how do, we, how do we think with that? How do we use um, digital practices, digital tools, um, and the ability to kind of speak across time and space and digital context to, um, to make that our superpower, like to, to make our kind of, um, our blindness to um, what is happening in so many internal spaces now that we're all at home, how do we turn that into um, something that we can supercharge um, for, our own, um, for our own freedom practices? So the fibril. 
So in grappling with these tensions, um, I, this is not new work, um, I realize. Um, and I think that there's something comforting in that. Um, it's not the first time we've seen a pandemic, um, the, the earth has seen a pandemic, and it's not the first time that uh, we are grappling with um, the rise of uh, extreme dispossession and violence. Um, and it's gonna, just gonna get worse before it gets better. Uh, and so what are the ways um, that this is a practice that has, that has been before and how can we throw back to that? The seen and unseen fibers between things. This is for me, when, I, when I'm trying to reach for uh, models, um, this is an ancient diasporic work. Um, so in this, I um, think about um, uh, Edouard Glissant. So in Poetics Revelation, um, Martin Dugan poet, writer, and theorist Edouard Glissant writes, the slave trade came through the cramped doorway of the slave ship, leaving a wake like that of a crawling, of crawling desert caravans. It might be like this, the east, the lands of America to the west. This creature is in the image of a fibril. And I hope somebody does ask me about this creature piece because I don't think I've gotten into it very much in, in my remarks today, but the, the, his naming it of a, as a creature, I think is actually very intentional. So what do you understand about this symbol, this sign, this fibril? What diaspora play is Glissant um, drawing us to by invoking a sign? It's not even a word, um, it's, it's an image. Um, According to, we can think of Fibrilla in, in, in different ways, like just where it kind of appears in our language today. We can think of Timothy Cox um, uh, and kind of brain mappings of Fibrilla as, as uh, one of the mechanisms by which myriad impulses and messages can transmit in your brain. Um, we can think of Fibrility, um, not F-I-B-R-I-L, uh, uh, but F-E-B-R-I-L, um, a rise in the temperature of the body, a symptom of infection, which is quite apt for now, fever, feverishness, um, any change in bodily function that, that is a symptom that shows this kind of fever. Um, and so, you know, there is a way that, you know, the kind of fibril gestures to the, the illness that is the experience, the, 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 the creation of this slave trade, and also to um, what might be some of the, the solutions, some of the repair and the care um, that goes towards um, speaking back to that. Um, Glissan is writing this in an asterisk, in a footnote, in the marginality of the main text, um, in the underwater deeps that he then goes on to describe. So he goes on to say, um, and he's here he's grappling with these kind of constituent elements of diaspora. This is what the poetics of relation are about. Um, he's, he's describing the terror of, quote, these lowest depths, these deeps, traversed by the slave ship and punctuated by bodies of Africans thrown overboard. Um, he's claiming the dead as being underwater signposts. So at the same time as these dead are being created in this moment, of um, the pandemic that is the slave trade. Um, they are also um, marking the course, a uh, quote, mark the course between the Gold Coast and the Leeward Islands. Um, these charts, um, with them, Gleason is able to chart a course for African descended history, politics, and identity that challenges the cartography of the known world. Um, and, and this is important because he doesn't speak of land and the ceremonies of possession that we are sort of used to thinking of when we're thinking of claiming space and, and creating nation and, and state statism, um, planting a flag and closing space. Um, he's, um, he's not thinking, and, and in that, he's not thinking in ways that maybe we're sort of used to, even in our sort of digital spaces and, and the, the, the space of the academy. Um, conversations about paywalls, labor, server farms, misinformation, surveillance, biopolitics, facial recognition, funding, um, and where funding comes from. Um, instead, in a new world where Blackness has been categorized as non-being, unthought, um, spectacle of death and more, Glissant and others look beyond these terrestrial longitudes and latitudes of conquest for where galaxies of life and humanity might be possible. They fling a lifeline, the fibril, the filament, the, the fiber across time and space to make new relations of care. And so to draw a line from Glissant to Black feminist thought of Christina Sharp, um, in this work, in her book, uh, In the Wake on Blackness and Being, she writes, I want to think the wake as a problem of and for thought. I want to think care as a problem um, for thought. I want to think care in the wake as a problem for thinking and of and for Black non being in the world. To put it another way, in the wake is a work that insists and performs that thinking needs um, and that thinking and care need to stay in the wake. So essentially thinking about what are the ways that uh, tending to those underwater signposts, attending to the the connections um, um, and the fibers that, that and, and, and 
and weaving new fibers that connect us. How can that be critical work that the digital humanities can and must do? Now, Christina is not, now Dr. Sharp is not speaking to digital humanities per se here. I'm thinking that actually we can use some of this in the work that we are called to do, um, particularly as that this is, um, this is the repair that I think digital humanities, if we rest on humanism, if we rest on the storytelling, if we rest on the creation of new languages, can offer a world where technology, science, digitalia, um, and the innovations therein, all of these depend and owe so much um, on what was sown and sown by those who were deemed black or disposable or defenseless or unthought. Um, this is the dark side of digital humanities. Scholars have talked about it um, before, um, but this is also where the human in our digital um, must and I think can hold some kind of sway. Um, Glissant, um, you know, I'm thinking about um, the Fibril offers us, you know, this challenge, like the only written thing on slave ships was the account book listing the exchange value of slaves. So he's using non-language, I'm sorry, not non-language, he's using a non-text um, specifically here. Um, for a purpose. Um, it means thinking about data that screams within the ship's space, the cry of those deported was stifled as it would be in the plantations. This confrontation between the stifled voice, the stifled sound, the stifled cry, and the thing that has been written, the thing that is written down, the thing that can be quantified, the data, this still reverberates um, to this day. And again, Blusan, of course, is not necessarily talking about the digital. But again, I think we can reach into this work and take something really powerful and important from it. Um, in thinking about these connections, it also means for me thinking beyond the space where we have often sort of sought digital humanist relation. And I think that means thinking, you know, those spaces being the academy, think tanks, social science policy centers, the media, um, to where digital space more commonly operates unseen and unacknowledged. I think that there are ways that we're going to have to, in some ways, no better time than in our homes here, um, as we'll talk about in a second, um, to move beyond some of the um, institutional um, states that we have uh, in some ways cleaved to um, and cleaved to structuring in some ways because we've had to. Uh, so um, so this is my grandmother and my great aunt, um, Mary Lou. <laughs> um, and I bring this forward um, as a way to kind of create, um, um, to work through the rest of this talk is going to be kind of working through some of these, um, these fibers, these, uh, these filaments that I am fascinated with in, um, in this record of uh, an archive uh, and uh, a relation um, that I'm working through for, for some of my own work, but it's not unfamiliar to work that Black, um, particularly Black scholars and Black theorists are working through. For example, Christina Sharp in The Wake Again, though she was not part of any organized Black movements except in how one's life and mind are organized by and positioned to apprehend the world through the optic of the door and anti-Blackness, my mother was politically and socially astute. Um, and so the question for me is, what is the line that we draw from our digital work to women like our grandmothers, our mothers? Um, what are the ways that this, the, the work that they um, did um, to create community, create kinship, to understand the world, to manage the politics at their own kitchen tables is actually also digital work? Um, does the digital require um, our computers, our, our Wi-Fi, our, our, our devices, um, or is there something more to the digital that we actually need to be tapping into? Um, and this is, um, this is interesting work, I think, um, for me to be thinking with, and I, and I hope many of us will, um, because already it's hard to, for the digital humanities broadly to acknowledge in some ways Black historical computational work. Um, so historical computational work done by Black scholars. Um, we have here W.E.B. Du Bois, he attempted to write a history of, um, uh, of, of many events and, and, to, and to chart, these are, these, are, these are his infographics, basically his data visualizations of Black life in the South um, in, the, um, in the early 20th century, um, um, created for the 1900 um, exposition um, in, in Paris. Um, he created over 60 charts, graphs, and maps um, that visualized the data on the state of Black life, hand-drawn <laughs> as part of an exhibit of American Negroes. Um, so we, we don't talk about this necessarily in the, in the compendium of digital humanities and in its history. Um, we don't talk necessarily about Carter G. Woodson's research team at Howard University and the creation of um, Association for the Study of Negro Life and History and the data work and the, and the research that they did compiling information like um, these are free, um, free Black um, 
uh, slave owners um, in different states. This is an image from the from the um, chart for Louisiana, um, and we don't. Um, and so we don't. We already in the digital humanities have a hard time sort of seeing black people as having um, a kind of computational history. Um, and we've we've talked about that in iterations like Black Code Studies and Slavery in the Machine, Special Issue, Archipelago, Archipelago's Journal, and the most recent emergence of Elchamar Naj with um, a range of scholars, um, including, and I'm going to list, um, I'm going to list several because um, I think it's important to say their names, Aaliyah Brown, Terry Conley, Ahmad Green, Lauren Kramer, Alessandra Rango, Joy James, Mark Anthony Neal, Alex Gio, Kayan McGrolliver, Melina Doubt, um, Kelly Baker Joseph, Jemaya Figueroa, Christina Thomas, Halle Ashby, Kelsey Moore, I Jada, uh, Jada Simulton, Stephanie Bravo, Sarah Bruno, and this is just a selection. Um, and many more have challenged the exception and excision of Black computational thought, like digital and data orientation, from conceptions of the digital more broadly that render um, Black people somehow alien to technological formulations. Um, uh, Afghan said, not how, why are, are Black people part of this? Um, these scholars, myself included, have been asking, how do we um, how do we code with and through the work that has already happened? How do we code with and through the kind of fissures and blank spaces, the empty fields um, in the in the landscape of um, in of black life? So instead of, of of cleaving to what is there, what is seen, what can be quantified and thrown into a chart or created into an exhibit or um, or an online archive, um, how do we attend to what is you know what is unseen? What is what is in these underwater deeps? Um, and black coding. Um, well, let me skip that part. Um, so there's already that that's happening. Um, what I'm beginning to explore now is about how Black people, Black women in particular, actually grapple with time and with disaster, with kinship and memory in the ways that that's actually also very much part of a digital landscape, um, a digital sensibility and understanding of the world. So um, I have seen this in particular with with Black women, um, and so and they are also um, it's a lot of ways the 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 population and the group and the thought carriers that I that I foreground in my own work. Um, so I want to turn to Christina Thomas, who has um, written this um, for Electric Modernage. The rules between the archive and my Nana's living room are quite similar. Have permission to enter, no eating or drinking in this space, no touching sensitive materials, and place objects back where you found them. The only difference between my Nana and an archivist was the consequences of not following the rules. One could give a stern warning, the other a stern hand. Located in the higher part of the home, the living room was safe from the floodwaters that threatened to come during a hurricane or a heavy rainstorm. As the years and storms went by, my Nana placed even more photographs, documents, and other objects in the sanctuary of that living room, taking more precaution as Hurricane Matthew flooded her home in 2016. And I wanted to read that in full because I think it's important to kind of sit with the ways that um, Black women, Black diasporic women, um, Black Southern women, Black Caribbean women um, have often modeled what it means to do work in times of pandemic and disaster and, and protests, um, have modeled the ways that um, keeping to the stories and the memories and the spaces and the um, and the fables and the myths and the legends, um, the origin stories, um, that has been work that has often um, been in the hands of, of, of those who sew and sew um, in, in living rooms and in kitchens and in homes. Um, and there, those practices, I think, are practices that um, we have not always attended to and, and, and humbled ourselves to learn, particularly in digital spaces. Uh, and we are, you know, we can be doing better with that. And if there's ever a time to kind of think about what are the ways that we can invoke those practices, um, this, is, this is one of them. How do um, Black women mark time and space in a world of overlapping and ever-changing diasporas? I mean, this is the question that digital humanists are um, of, of marking time and of managing overlapping layers and matrices and, and programming. And this is the work that we are we have often turned to, um, but we are not always turning to those who have been doing it for a long time. Um, these are images from my grandmother's archive, which is, was very extensive. She passed away in October of 2019 um, and was herself a kind of um, 
living historian, just in the same way um, as Christina Thomas and Christina Sharp are speaking of their mothers um, and grandmothers and, and elder women and their family, um, pulled from and created um, webs and, and networks of kin through things like photos, um, playbills, um, scraps, newspapers, um, marked time and space in particular ways. This is my other grandmother, um, the one um, from Puerto Rico, um, Usuado, um, the, the, this image, these images are from my grandmother who was born in um, Troy, Alabama and, and migrated to Chicago um, as a young woman, uh, as a young girl. Um, so this one is um, an address book, um, a, a uh, what you call it, a, a comma separated values doc document, <laughs> and uh, and the um, and the information that uh, and the marking of time that um, my grandmother um, uh, from Mutuado, um also did. Um, so you can see um, some of them. We can skim it. You can sort of decipher the language here. A lot of them are birthdays and, and death dates. Um, but you can also see some key moments to all Puerto Ricans is the death of Roberto, Roberto Clemente, uh, 1972. Um, and one that, that um, it also was an interesting marking of time um, when I came across it, because I did not, did not remember this moment. Um, 1996, the Vidal uh, Zapateria exploded um, in Puerto Rico. Um, this is an image of that explosion. Uh, and so, so there are ways, um, so I guess one of the things that I'm grappling with um, as a as somebody who is very interested in the digital, who is invested in how these tools can be used and, and practiced and, 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 and mobilize for humanistic thought, you know, not just for digital sake, but for humans to exist and, and thrive and live in the world. You know, what are the ways that, um, that these are practices that um, can be, um, that we can learn from? Um, that we can um, find resources in. How are we finding resources in the work that our that our mothers and our grandmothers and our elders um, have done for so long and did in order to do exactly the same thing to sustain, to create freedom spaces, to create memory, to create ties between the past and the present, um, and ties between um, what is um, there and what is um, and, and what is to come. Um, I'm just watching my time. Okay, I think I have enough time. I think it'll be good. Okay. Um, and so, um, so thinking back with um, Glissant, um, this is um, his map of a table of diaspora. Um, uh, I want to find a route through the digital humanities that isn't just about projects we throw up and use for um, for padding. Um, RCVs or centers created to pad university budget lines, um, where the fever of 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 managing, um, of conquering new grants, of new fields, of new territories is broken. Like I want a digital humanities that offers a different map for Black life in particular, because that is my preoccupation. But all life, um, I want instead uh, a digital humanities where we are attuned to something that looks more like hanging clothes on the line or graining pen marks on pages, work that answers questions offered by um, um, Yomara C. Figueroa and her archive of disappearances, um, where she speaks to, and here I'm, um, I've been thinking about what, are the, what does it mean to kind of map memories over um, this kind of diaspora map, um, which is both geographic and also, as you can see, distinctly not. You see um, Liberia all the way over here, Haiti and Caribbean can be broken up somewhere in the middle. Um, far to the left is the United States, the deep south, but so is the Eastern littoral of the Americas. Um, and I can come back to this DNA map actually, um, because there are other ways that, um, somebody will ask me this in the question and answer. There's some really interesting ways that DNA uh, and Alain also speaks to this, that um, that Black folk have been um, quite uh, invested in um, technology, science, DNA, um, and the digital practices that operate therein, everything from the big reveal to um, the way that ancestry is created, these kind of social media-ish um, private because they're behind ancestry's paywall, which we can talk about as part of some of the issues. But um, but these kind of social media managing spaces where people can have these um, robust conversations and find family and find kin, even as you know, we can also talk about ancestry's complicated um, commercialization and, and and publicity of of, of its own software and, and how that relates to African diasporic um, identity and violence. Um, but yes, all right. So um, 
So I want to digitally humanize that the answers questions offered by um, Dr. Fido and her archive of disappearances. What does it mean to be a colonial subject torn from our home and pulled to it, like the many waves of the Atlantic? What does it mean to be a race disappeared from the archive? And I would add to this, what does it mean to also continually find oneself in um, in archives that are um, created in our community that are that are um, indie um, and indigenous to um, to ourselves and to our families um, to continually find archivists like Nana, like my grandmother, like um, like uh, other um, elders um, who are doing this work um, not because it's um, it, it's it's laudatory in some other outside way, but because it just has to. It's a quilting that has to be done. It's, it must be sewn. Um, so um, I wanted to, uh, one, what does it mean to have a digital humanities that uh, uh, that tells this story? Um, what does it mean to um, to be, to have a digital humanities, a digital uh, storytelling practice that answers a challenge brought by um, Hallie Ashby in the Fugitive Handbook, which is created by the um, electricians of electric marinage. We refuse the confinements of the academy that require the meritocracy, professionalism, professional, professionalism and strict disciplinary bounds. We remain accountable to the kitchen table. Uh, the electricians are digital curators of a new world view. And in this, again, it kind of gestures me back to Glissant's map of diaspora, which is geographic and also not geographic and not bound by land at all. Um, a new worldview by blurring, blending, and transcending modes of scholarship and strictures of disciplines. We're demanding that black and brown women be read differently and we will be read on our own terms. Um, so what does it mean to, to think about how our digital practice um, demand something similar um, or is attuned to something similar, attuned to those who will be read on their own terms, accepts and will re read others on their own terms. Um, Glissant gathers his his people, um, and, and I, I turn a lot to Glissant because I find relation to be incredibly useful and evocative right now for me, um, but I think there are other scholars who are, are thinking um, past and present, who are thinking about these things in, in similar and, and, and generative ways. Glissant gathers his people and confronts the West's um, refusal to map terrain of Black being um, by populating relation with the constellation of selves. Um, uh, we know ourselves, uh, this is a quote, this not, we know ourselves as part and as crowd in an unknown that does not terrify. We cry our cry of poetry, our boats are open and we sail them for everyone. Um, the digital humanities does not yet quite sail for everyone. Um, but I think that there are ways that uh, it, it's being attuned to these, um, these older methods and, and ancient methods of, of diasporic um, weaving, sewing, fibers, filaments of care, um, that it's possible that it could, um, that it could sell for everyone. And I think one of the questions we have, and that I think everyone, um, that all of you have, um, hopefully, um, will be what are the ways that, that we can make that, make that happen? Um, and whether it can, what are the ways we can make that, um, what are the ways that that depends on, on what we do and, and us and our practices moving forward. Um, and, and like just one last minute, um, the way that I am trying to also move this forward myself in my own work is I direct, um, we just launched this summer in the midst of pandemia. And so our theme is, uh, is actually insurgency. Um, we launched a project at um, Johns Hopkins um, called Life Code, PH Against Enclosure, um, which uh, evokes and um, embodies this grammar of refusal and a language of freedom for digital humanities, um, is trying to, in a lot of ways, practice some of this um, other ways of thinking of, of, and of connection and of care um, that, um, that I'm relating to and thinking through today. So many of the people that I'm quoted um, uh, in, this, um, in this talk are also working as part of Life Code, um, Electric Maranaj, they had Electric Maranaj as part of um, Life Code, as well as a collaboration with Mayra C. Figueroa at um, Michigan State University. Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that and um, the keywords projects um, that we have going going on, uh, particularly related to Black Louisiana. So, and I will end there with some um, kind of data visualization map of, um, of New Orleans. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Um, I am going to take a look at the Q&A and see if we have some questions. Right, so 
at the moment, we don't have any questions, but we do have a comment. Um, would you like for me, I can read the comment out loud and see if they're, or, the, or actually the person if they want to as well, I'm not sure. Sure, whichever way works. <laughs> I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just read it. They're not jumping on. I'll read. So um, they said just a comment. I am Yay. so, yeah. I am so excited that you highlighted the charts and figures created for industrial fairs and expos, sociological labs, and other kinds of public exhibits. I read incredible descriptions of these materials and sources I use in my work, and sometimes get to see grainy black and white newspaper images of them. Unfortunately, so few of these large display items are preserved in archives. Smaller hand drawn <clears throat> charts and figures are preserved mostly in early to mid 20th century uh, theses and dissertations, especially at HBCUs. Thank you for some new insights on these items. Jeanette Garrett Scott. Thank you. Yes, Jeanette. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. No, uh, so this is really important actually, um, I'm glad that we got to read that aloud um, because there is something, this is in some ways, um, some of the, like these are some of the concrete practices that um, we can engage in as we're thinking through, you know, what are the ways that are, um, it, for those who are positioned in, um, in some orientation to the university, what are the ways that our practices can actually move sort of beyond where DH, capital D, capital H is, is centrally located, often in centers, often in departments and and um, and in libraries on university campuses. Um, and often those are not the HBCUs are not necessarily always liberal arts colleges, although um, one of the most one of the more dynamic dual humanities um, centers of gravity um, was five college DH, which I believe um, is still operating, um, and the immersive reality lab, which is um, with Mercer Parham now at University of Maryland, um, but was rooted in like the five colleges colleges system. But often what we have are you know like that's not necessarily where we think of as digital humanities centers. We think of Myth or Matrix um, Myth, which is at University of Maryland. Matrix is at Michigan State. We think of um, the lab at um, University of Nebraska, which has been doing amazing work. We think of um, Penn's, um, you know, the work around the, uh, the Penn Dream Lab. Um, and there is, and those are important spaces, um, obviously, um, and they have been important um, centers of institutional centers of gravity for advancing just humanities within the academy broadly. Um, but HBCUs have also been really, really critical um, foundational places where Black scholars and Black research, historical research related to Black life has been done, um, where you can go into the archive um, at places like Fisk, at places like Dillard, at places at the Moreland Springer Library at Howard University, at the Amistad Research Center, um, which was formerly at Dillard, which is now um, at Tulane's campus. Um, you can go in there and find these hand-drawn um, um, charts and figures and the kind of work that Black scholars did once upon a time in the face of racist positiv positivism and in the face of scientific racism to literally chart a whole different Western schema um, and um, try and flip on its head <laughs> all the assumptions that were coming out of the German, German Academy, which became the US in a lot of ways, um, Social Science Academy. Um, and so what are the ways that we as scholars, for those of us who are interested in, in Black life in particular, but I think that applies broadly to anybody who's a digital humanist actually should be in these archives, thinking about and thinking with these hand drawn, these drawings, these figures, these charts and graphs. They should be thinking with um, the kinds of photographic um, archives and, and the collections that are deposited by individuals at places like Amistad Research Center, um, which has um, uh, uh, collections by, you know, that are left by people. Um, and you can see the ways that, you know, photographs, um, recipe books, um, playbills, all of these are part of the kinds of memory and rememory and, 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 and fibrous connections that are that is work that has been so central to Black diasporic life. So, um, so concrete steps, um, appreciate HBCUs, appreciate the community colleges, do the work to make those connections to those institutional spaces because they have so much to offer um, and to teach us at PWIs about what the work actually is all about. Yeah. Thanks Dr. Garrett Scott.
<laughs> Thank you. Um, I have another question. Um, this is uh, by Sylvia Fernandez. Um, and she says, Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for such an amazing talk. Could you please tell more about how tell more about how do you see the potential of mapping memory with communities that have been displaced, have migrated or been deported, as well as ways of telling stories through digital humanities? Thank you, Sylvia. Um, these are um, this is some of actually the most important work that I think uh, digital humanities can do digital tools can offer and I know there's a lot of ways that um, people can be down on, on on digital things and spaces and media and, and misinformation and all of this and I think that that is also very true I, obviously we're literally in the midst of a misinformation and erased information flow right now um, but what tools can also offer are spaces where people can um, narrate and tell their stories um, in their own time and in their own way. Uh, so I think that there's ways like, um, I'm thinking of Alex Gilles work um, with Rupika Rizam, um, and there's another person who's on this project as well, um, called Torn Apart Separados, um, which was mapping uh, the, uh, the uh, children who are being torn apart at the border and in the concentration camps by ICE. Um, and so there's work there of like actually mapping um, people and finding people. They were doing similar work. Um, I, can't, I, I can't say the technology is modeled off of it, but I know they were doing similar work when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. And they, was, they were doing work finding, um, a PR on the map was the project. Um, and they were doing work finding people um, because of the down communication lines and the down infrastructure um, uh, decimated by the hurricane and, and the unnaturalness of um, infrastructure maintenance um, of a colonial society. Uh, that, uh, you know, they were doing the, the mapping process of, of finding people and charting people in spaces also was the thing that was really important. So there's the mapping of like just finding people um, and marking them in time and taking away that kind of faceless, you know, um, num numerization of like, oh, so many, this percentage of how many children are, we don't know how many children are, are being, are taken from the border. We don't know, how can we find out? Um, that work of, of, of finding persons is actually such important um, humanizing and humanist work. Um, but there's also the, the work of, of telling stories um, and of, of collecting stories or creating spaces where people can offer their own stories. I think there's also ways that everybody does not want to tell their story. And so, you know, there's that managing of, you know, the positionality of who is allowed to tell whose story, what those stories are doing for um, the individual that they're being told to, um, what are the ways that, 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 the academy sort of does a kind of a lurid um, fetishization of people's, you know, internal lives and trauma and and the and the things that they have gone through um, and that don't necessarily then serve to to change the actual quality of life and existence of the people who are experiencing it. Um, so there's 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 things there to be cautious of, um, but there are also ways that that people have things to say. So when, um, as an example, so when Hurricane Maria happened. Um, one of the projects that um, that I was affiliated with um, was um, uh, uh, Palabras Puerto Rico, and a group of um, of scholars went down, um, researchers, uh, witnesses. I'll just say because I feel like that's a better word for what we, what what we were doing. Um, I did not go with them. Um, went to Puerto Rico to collect the stories um, from those who had survived um, the hurricane and who either remained on the island or, or came back in the midst of um, in the midst of the rebuilding and reconstruction. And what was important about that was not that those stories are were useful in any place outside of where they're being told. Um, what was important was that um, they those stories needed to get out of people um and they talked about how this is the first time they could they had told this story um this is the first time they told the story of the night of the storm or what happened after or this happened or that happened so it was a catharsis piece that was part of it and an important again marking of time that was important for those who were actually telling their stories so the key piece there i think um sort of is 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 what are the ways that our digital story is actually at service of those who have the stories and not at service of our of, of, of anything else really. Like what are the ways that this is moving for them into a place where they are able to mark time or they are able to, to keep the memory um, and and that we can then serve as at best witnesses and at, 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 you know, if not that, just kind of get out of the way um, and make sure that we have um, 
we have made ourselves available and, and be in a service. Um, but I, you know, there's more to say there, of course. So it's a great question. Great, thank you so much uh, for that answer. Um, I think we have uh, time for one more question. Oh gosh, uh, I'll stop talking so much. <laughs> no, not at all, unless, I mean, you can extend, but I mean, there, there's, but there's time for one more question for sure. So um, uh, the extended answers are really appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah. Um, this one's from Joey Orr um, over at our uh, Spencer Museum of Art. Um, he says, some of my thinking has been about queer sociality that takes advantage of often impermanent and fleeting resources as a structure of political formation. Can you say more about how you connect the clothesline and kitchen table as connecting with the digital as a fiber? Thank you so much. What a great question. Um, yes, absolutely. I think that there is um, something very important um, about the ephemeral here. And that's been something that has been a, a major preoccupation of how I have approached digital spaces and digital technology and tools and resources. I've said this before, but um, I am not a digital humanist through the academy in any kind of way. I mean, the extent to which um, I have entered into the digital um, is, uh, it, it was through um, community was through um, radical women of color organizing and blogging, was through um, radical media and spaces like um, the Ally Media Conference. And the ethos has always been in those, in my practice in those spaces and in, in many of the practices of, of the communities and the individuals that I um, have engaged with and love very much, um, that the ephemeral is just fine, that, that is, this is not about, the work is not about creating um, institutions um, that um, that that uh, are to then replace the kind of predatory institutions that we're taking down. <laughs> um, the work is to um, to create and find um, ways of relation um, that um, are productive, that are generative, that are safe, and that are full of care. And so, um, so I, so I think that there's ways that here that um, that this is um, an important connection. Um, the the work. The, it is a, a fundamental reality, uh, particularly of, of black black femme spaces, um, that the places where we have been put to work have also been places where we um, have had to recreate them and turn them into some kind of relation. And that's a, either kinship relation, intimate relation, um, a relation of hands over the kitchen table. Um, these have been places where we have been sent to cook, we have been sent to clean, we have been sent to put up laundry, um, the ironing boards, the, the seamstressing, you know, and again, I'm, I'm pulling back into like slavery spaces, of course, but I think these are spaces that historically and traditionally have have been and have remained um, particularly of color, if not black, um, and particularly um, femme identified. Um, and and our politics have been, you know, built and merged in these in the profane in the profanity of these spaces in a lot of ways. And and we and in that we've also made them really sacred. Um, and so I do think there is a there's an interesting connection between the clothesline and the kitchen table. Um, I do think there's also ways that we can take that. Um, that combination of, of the of the labor um, of, of where we've been, where labor has been imposed um, and 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 that layered with and and interposed and, and intermixed with um, it being also a space where pleasure has happened, where politics have happened, um, where the where profane um, audacity and resistance has been has been bred and created, um, and the creativity of that. Um, particularly in, in black, black, black femme hands. Um, I think that we, I think that that's in some ways, those practices are things that we can embody as we're thinking about the digital. Um, and so what are the ways that, you know, we are um, allowing some um, um, unfinished, messy, ephemeral conversations or structures to exist? What are the ways that we're challenging um, structures of data that you know, um, why it has to be replicated. One of the like sort of truths of that is it has to be replicated. Why? Um, <laughs> you know, what are the, what are the assumptions that we're challenging on a kind of like very very basic level um, that that can speak to our digital practice? And what are the ways that our storytelling also um, it can also can also embody some of that as well? You know, I think there's um, there's 
sometimes a desire, particularly because it feels so urgent right now, a desire not to, a desire not to, to, to sit with the kind of dangly edges of, of unfinished, um, of unfinished campaigns or wins or strategies or politics or politics that seem like they don't, you know, lead to, you know, some liberation promised land that we have imagined in our head. Um, and I think that there's ways that, um, that is both a kind of reality of, of some of the engagement that happens across digital and social spaces. Um, and also like the same flagrance of digital and social spaces speaks to how that, that, is, um, that is not possible and that, that, that a kind of finished product of liberation is not, that's, that's not, um, not that that's not the goal, because I think that for, is the goal for some, but that that's actually not the point. Um, the point is a practice of humanism that gets us all to a more species-wide relation with each other, uh, at least as I understand it, as I, as I believe in it. Um, and so I think that those are the kinds of things we can bring into the digital. That's the, kind, that's the, 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 the flexibility, the, the fluidity of the fiber, I think can also help us kind of begin to kind of think about how do we weave these practices and how do we sit with you know, you know, the unfinished, you know the cut the cut fiber, um, and and you know how do we you know make a knot and just kind of hang on it, um, and that's a quote from um, I was reading something about Ruth Bader Ginsburg that somebody had said um, even when the rope ran out she made a knot at the end and just hung on, um, and people I'm sure have many thoughts about R B G and 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 her life and her choices and and her sentiments but that um, that that metaphor and that visualization I think can be really really apt for thinking about how we um, how we might relate to some of these um, unfinished pieces that feel so tantalizing and um, and also provocative and uncomfortable as well. Wow, thank you, thank you for that. Um, you've definitely, uh, Dr. Johnson, given us a uh, a lot to sit with and to think through, and um, I will make sure to um, send and along perhaps a couple of the questions from students that didn't get a chance to, but I wanna um, close out on time because um, I, I really appreciate and respect the time that you've taken to, to be here with us. And um, on behalf of everyone here, I just want to uh, extend uh, thanks and um, yeah, thank you so much. Yay, thank you all so much. Thank you for, um, for being here and for the amazing questions. I hope that um, we can talk more uh, in the future. Yeah, please reach out. <laughs>